Good evening. We don't need to wait. This will sit on Instagram for the next 24 hours and then we'll have it up on our YouTube. And thank you for your help with that. We'll focus tonight on strength and conditioning for martial arts, for fighting, for combat sports. And we got some great questions, so we'll move into those shortly. Just wanted to lay a foundation. <clears throat> I've trained in martial arts for a long time. I've trained in strength and conditioning for a long time. One led me into the other. I wasn't a strength guy that got into grappling or kickboxing or anything like that. I was uh, in martial arts, changed martial arts, and then was met with the rapid awareness that my strength and conditioning was not where it needed to be to actually fight with people that knew how to fight. So that's when I started realizing that I needed to make intelligent improvements to my training without detracting from my martial arts practice. That, that was always the challenge. I was doing a lot at the time. I was riding BMX a lot still, training a lot. And once we had found CrossFit, prior to that, I was just, you know, sitting on a rowing machine and lifting a light kettlebell and, and whatever. Once we had found CrossFit, we experimented with that type of stuff. But even out of the gate, you know, 2002, 2003, <clears throat> we were experimenting on changing that to make sure that we didn't cash out too much and not have anything left for our actual application. So that's one of the things that we've built the foundation on over the last handful of years is making sure that we're addressing strength and conditioning so that it will complement the intended application. It's got to be hard. There's days that it has to be heavy, but it's got to tax us as well as build us. It should insulate, not simply erode. And so when it comes to training for that type of application, there's no one perfect way, but there is a lot of bad ways and, and we see a lot of them and wanted to at least address that somewhere that people can refer back to or if, if their friends are training or fighting, maybe this will help them a little bit. The risk reward ratio is, is a big one. People that are competing in combat sports in general are extremely durable. So if a trainer tells them to do something, they're gonna do it. If something seems like a good idea, if something seems like it's gonna, um, I don't know, elicit that adrenaline rush that they want, they will probably try it for training. That doesn't mean it's a good idea. We think about strength and conditioning as sometimes an assassination and sometimes a street fight. And you need to know the difference and your trainer especially needs to be able to apply the difference. There, there has to be difficulty to it and there has to be severity to it because you're preparing yourself for something arduous and potentially dangerous but that in and of itself shouldn't be the danger. Last thing I'll mention before we look at some of the questions that came up is I've had conversations with really strong and really smart people that are primarily strength coaches in relation to this very topic and the notion that there is such a thing as strong enough. And there is. If, if your prime directive is powerlifting, weightlifting, then there is never, there is never such thing as, as too much strength. There is always more and that is always the goal. Uh, but if your goal is to fuck people up or your goal is to, your goal is to control people in grappling or your goal is to compete successfully in martial arts, strength, coordination, power, conditioning, dexterity, all these things have to align in a way that, that your training has to, your training has to suit, your training has to complement. So when we apply strength and conditioning for fighting and, and when we apply strength and conditioning for anything, there's a skill-based element to it that transfers directly into something tactile and technical like martial arts. When we think about transferable concepts, po power is, is a product of connectivity, timing, midline stability, all these things that can be built and honed and, and, and detailed out in strength and conditioning as, as long as we know what we're doing and why. And just like a lot of things, it comes down to positioning. Something that has always been curious to me is how much detail people are willing to put into a martial arts technique and 
how undetailed we often see the strength and conditioning that insulates and improves that very thing. People will drill so long and, and so hard on one thing and, and then go and do, you know, weird partial range of motion lifts, goofy body weight stuff, way too much of stuff, not nearly enough of others. And ultimately, even if people are successful, we believe that there's an awful lot of optimization out there that is not found yet. And, and part of it is how we balance the scales and which tools we use and, and when and why. Uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the questions got us into that. So, so we'll, 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 let's see if I can do this. If, if this messes up, I'm sorry. I'll be right back. Questions. There they are. Tap a response to show it on your screen. No, let's not do that. Okay. Curious about bulletproofing tendons, tendons and joints. I'd like to see more of that question. Can I see it? Yeah. So when it, when it comes to that type of stuff, as you know, martial arts is, is good for building that and bad for building that. It also breaks it down. When we think about building tensile strength, that's where we incorporate a lot of kettlebell and mace stuff. That's, why, that's where we, we incorporate lots of sensible, heavy enough to be useful kettlebell and mace stuff. And that's all predicated on the detail that goes into the lift and the movement. The way that we look at that stuff is that is your positional insulators. If you're going to build baseline strength, it's, it's probably going to happen with a barbell. And as long as you're moving in proven patterns with full ranges of motion and good mechanics, that barbell is going to be a safe tool. But when it comes to transferring to fighting, there has to be other tools. The barbell will be the heaviest pound for pound always, but it will also be the most cooperative. And, and again, when it comes to handling someone or something that doesn't want to be handled, less cooperative is more valuable when it comes to a strength and conditioning tool. So moved well, moved heavy, uh, kettlebells and, and maces will, will help bulletproof tendons and joints. And it will also help us work safely past intended end ranges, which ultimately you're going to end up in, uh, in, in any time you're fighting. First MMA fight. February 12 and eight kilogram maces programming or movements recommended. Well, yeah, I mean, there's a million things on our site. Uh, realistically, as long as it's smart and done well, using the mace, especially after a, a training day, if you're going to move it a little bit lighter and in a much lower rep scheme before a training, a, a martial arts training day would be a good idea just as a, as a, as a real short outline um, but realistically, as long as it's intelligent, the maces are a great tool. We think it's the best tool to insulate uh, the positions that you're going to use in, in martial arts, especially especially MMA, where you, you have no idea what's going to happen when. The mace is uncooperative in a lot of the same ways that a body is. There's, I mean, maybe 25, 30 videos of, of mace instruction on our site, maybe more. And if you have any direct questions, you're, wel you're welcome to ask us those as well. Thank you. Favorite movements, routines that work on improving flexibility as well as, as well as what? Someone smarter than me has got to tell me how I can see the whole fucking question. I'm just going to answer the part I can see. Uh, movements and routines that work on improving flexibility. So improving mobility, improving valuable range is best done after when you're warm. We refer to a lot of Kelly Sturette's stuff and we say, you, we say use it in small doses and, and only when it presents. There's no reason to do two hours of preemptive mobility. If something comes up and, and needs assessment and addressment, let, let's get to it. But there's no reason to just smash yourself into a flexible state that you don't need. You need to be able to function in the positions you can move in, especially when you're fighting. Fighting and yoga are two totally different things. You're, you're not necessarily 
just trying to move your body further. You've got to have you got to have control, and, and ultimately you've got to have power in all positions. So again, not to give not to give the same answer, but the ticks on the dial that the kettlebell and especially the mace, the way that we use it, allow for uh, will, will will really help improve mobility and improve positioning that will transfer directly and, and powerfully to fighting. So thank you. Good good question. Can I get away with just doing calisthenics outside of fight training? Well, sure, man. You can do whatever you want. Um, we, we, we believe that if you are in a weight class sport and you need to stay around your weight, but you need to get stronger and more powerful, that again, kettlebells and maces are a fantastic choice when lifted heavy enough and technically enough. Because we think about it as relative weight. So, so that mace or kettlebell is never going to be as heavy as a barbell. It's never going to be as heavy as some other implements, but it's building a lot of strength and it's building a lot of sneaky little strength. One thing we see and, and one great experience that we've had is, is when I've gotten to teach people that have been strength and conditioning with us for a while, some kickboxing or some grappling or things like that. And one, how fast they learn and two, how, how tough they are to deal with almost immediately just because of body awareness. Um, just because of the ability to apply a full movement, a full range movement pattern with with power, um, it, it's like this. It's like this systematic muscle memory. If if in strength and conditioning you're doing leg, hip, arm, last order of operations, and you go to throw strikes or you go to grab a hold of somebody and, and perform a throw on them, that leg, hip, arm, last is built. That thing is ready to go. If your strength and conditioning differs in concept and application from your fighting, then you just you're just trying to connect dots that aren't necessarily on the same line. Um, so calisthenics, yeah, of course, moving your body weight in strong positions. The, the, the gymnasts are the king of body weight control and strength. The weightlifting elements that we believe go hand in hand with martial arts are mid weight power positioning and a ton of detail making sure that you're moving at your body's full range of motion and also a little bit past in very controlled circumstances because you know you're going to get there in a fight and if you don't insulate it then that's that's when people get hurt thank you good questions Most important conditioning exercises. Yeah, so we'll, we'll address this with, um, it's not meant to be a vague answer. There's no most, there's no most important conditioning exercises. What, what, what we're thinking about when we're training anyone, but especially when we're training someone for something like fighting, is you're training systems and you're training patterns. You know, if, if, if what you're training is power or endurance, then what you're basically saying is, we know the fight is going to go past 15 or 20 seconds. Can you still kick ass in minute 14 of 15 in the same that you did in minute two? And that's not necessarily the byproduct of one great exercise. That's the byproduct of systematic application of an energy system in an intelligent way. And making sure that you haven't burned yourself out to the point where when it's time to actually apply that system whether it's in training or whether it's in an actual fight or match or whatever the case is, that you're not so taxed that you can't actually pull the trigger. So that's the other thing with, with, the, with the relative weight of kettlebells and maces. They're going to be very heavy, and, and the way that we lift them, they're heavy. However, they're never going to be as heavy as a barbell, so what we're actually looking for is the, the best use of the best tool for the job at hand, not simply the one that makes us the strongest, not simply the one that makes us the fastest, but the, the thing that makes the best mix of, of all of it. And for us, it's barbells, kettlebells, and maces. Bodyweight stuff is, is in there all the time, and barbell stuff is only in there in, in the beginning and then into maybe like the maybe like the the intermediate parts of that stuff, and then it's 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 little power endurance stuff and and kettlebell and mace lifting.
Yeah, so a kettlebell front rack position, I mean, uh, any kettlebell rack position, one or two kettlebells is, is, is a traditional boxing cover. So uh, realistically, it's, it's a perfect transfer. The other thing that it develops is just muscle memory of keeping your fist on your face. So the way that we rack the kettlebells, there's something attached to your face at all times. It provides a good tactile cue, and it also reminds us of where we need to be to hold our body in the strongest position. Many of you have probably tried to hold heavy kettlebells with your hand away from your face or something else, and it's just a lot harder. So it, uh, it's, it's a fantastic transfer of positioning. Thank you. Good question. Another good one from Eric. Does lifting weights actually make you slower as a fighter? It's a thing people say often. Um, lifting too much weight will make you slower. We see it all the time. People that have just prioritized strength have a lot of trouble when it comes to positioning, conditioning, and, and also sneaky stuff like power endurance. You can go really, really fast, really, really short, and it's tough to argue with watching that output, but the, the real difference is can you do it 10 times? Can you do it when someone's pushing and shoving you? Can you do it when someone's hand has been over your mouth or when you've been hit in the face? So weightlifting, absolutely great. Too much weight as a priority training for fighting. Uh, yeah, it makes, it makes you slower. And it, it also really builds a very singular type of muscle. Strength is strength. However, linear is also linear and lateral is lateral. And if all you're doing is moving heavy, heavy things straight up and straight down, you're limiting yourself in a way that a fight is going to require you to not be limited. So, uh, yeah, we lift weights, but we also temper heavy, heavy, heavy with really powerful medium and then really sneaky light mace stuff and things like that. Again, good questions. Thank you. We got some good ones. Hey Jim, thanks man. What work to what, what work to rest ratio do you recommend during strength endurance cycle for combat prep cycle? Jim unintentionally outsmarted me. So when we're when we're talking, I'll just address the work to I'll just address the work to rest. Um, when when you're when you're looking at something where you know there's going to be a three minute round and a one minute off. There are points in your training where you have to rest less than a minute, and there are points in training where you have to rest more than a minute. The output before and after is what's really going to govern what you would actually apply there and how often. So if you're resting 45 seconds, one strategy that we would use and, and we had good luck with with a couple people that fought <clears throat> was something low impact like a sprint on the bike, it, it's a catastrophe, but there is very little risk. Immediately getting off, resting less than the intended duration in a competition, and then hitting the bag, hitting pads, doing some clinch work, uh, doing some chest pummeling, whatever the case is. So you're forced to work taxed in a quicker period of time than you're going to in the actual fight. As we start getting closer to a fight, then the rest periods will shorten a little bit and the stimulus will change. But the work to rest ratios should mirror but not necessarily always match. If you, if you always rest a minute, you're very, very used to resting for a minute. Just like with anything else, there's a value to shaking that kind of stuff up. And then as far as strength endurance goes, that, that's also a good question, but one that's kind of a, a longer answer. The, the strength endurance is built over a long period of time. And as we kind of just alluded to, the strength endurance for, for people who are applying it in this particular context is going to be even or possibly less important than power endurance, baseline conditioning, uh, mental durability, and positional access. If, if you can work really, really well tired in taxing positions, um, then you will very well have success in, 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 in competition martial arts. If you are just strong and you can hold as hard as you can for a really long time, 
but you don't have the dexterity and fluidity and, and, and focus and technique uh, to apply it, then you've built a little too much strength and, and not insulated it with quite enough else. Uh, hope, hopefully that got you somewhere, Jim. Yeah, I mean, Bailey, that's a great question. I mean, the, the durability is going to be similar and how and how we how we address someone like like Dan, like someone like Dan Collar is not going to be too different from how we address someone who's fighting. He, he's going to have less of a time based constraint. Um, bike riding is not relaxing, but there's no clock on you for the most part anyway. So we would address people similarly, but differently. One way we would address them similarly is making sure that all the unilateral stuff is balanced out. They need to be able to work with, with both hands separate, really clean and fast and in powerful positions. So something like Dan, he trained with us for months and months, and I'm not sure he touched a barbell more than once or twice. Um, and that dude got super, super strong. So uh, that's a similar way that we, would, that we would build people out. And thanks, Bailey. Suggestions on how to work legs with a healing Achilles. I'm six months out from surgery. Yeah, that's tough. So, so be, be patient for sure. Keep that area warm. Make sure someone who knows what they're doing is, is, is getting some manual therapy in there. And sled pulls uh, backwards, not forwards. And, and not, not really, really heavy. And um, anchored at your waist, not anchored at your shoulders. So, so something that you can really control your midline. Make sure that you're staying, so if this is, if this is your head and this is your feet, make sure you're staying here. Don't, don't, don't start to bend and, and displace your vertical column when you're pulling that sled. So if, if, you're, if you're healing that Achilles and you've gotten clearance to work a little bit, be, of course, really, really careful with, with forward stuff. Um, the backwards stuff might, might be a better choice, and, and we've had good luck with, with people coming back from, from ankle and Achilles stuff sled pulls so backwards uh, moderate weight short hard steps and then also just train tracks not a tightrope so give your feet uh, room and, and, and ability to stabilize without having them too close together and then um, no, no duck foot so just as if you're doing a kettlebell swing or a deadlift stay really smart and straight and then drive those legs apart while you're, while you're walking safely backwards hope that helps Achilles is rough Thank you. That's nice. As far as conditioning goes, what is your take on Metcons for combat athletics? Um, well, this is not meant to be a sarcastic answer. So what, what, what I believe you're saying is uh, the the CrossFit term Metcon, which is just most often relegated to these like smash fests, attrition based, fucking hopper whatever, fifteen different things that make very little sense and rep schemes that make even less sense. Um, those I don't have a great fondness for those in general. I just think time better spent. You can build a lot of mental durability with way in more intelligent strategies than just beating yourself into the ground all the time. However, uh, the origin of the term uh, metabolic conditioning, yeah, yeah, metabolically conditioning yourself to fight is crucial. And, and it's kind of something we alluded to earlier. It's, it's working on energy systems. It's working on movement patterns. And, and it's making sure that they're at least as optimized as any person can get them by giving them intelligent stimulus. Some of the smartest and strongest people that we've worked with have been stuck in certain places and then we really helped unstick them by just kind of poking the beehive, see seeing what else came out. Um, so, so realistically we would just change a little bit of what they were doing with a different implement. So if, if what they would do is primarily deadlift then we would keep them in a strong hinge position, but we would just add like really heavy kettlebell swings, really heavy, powerful mace shovels, things like that. 
so w when it comes to baseline conditioning, um, metabolic conditioning, however you want to think about it, w one way that we get people well conditioned and well insulated in fantastic movement patterns is making sure that we're just changing the implement, changing the implement, but keeping all the strategies and structures the same. And that allows for, for an awful lot of work. And I guess, realistically, the, the least attrition you can undergo while pushing yourself hard enough to, to compete in combat sports. Heavy compound or light and lots of reps uh, for best mat transfer from Alex. Yeah, I mean, good good question also. And, and again, similar threads to things we've, we've been talking about. Too much is too much and, and too little is too little. And one of the ways we meet in the middle, as I just mentioned, is once the heavy stuff is over, the medium and the lighter stuff is going to work in the same systems. It's going to work in the same patterns. It's going to use slightly different tools. Um, we're we're going to still move with power and dexterity. And once we change the implement, the weights will change correspondingly and, and you're already building a new system. So th there's, a, there's a lot of, I guess, transferable benefit to lifting one thing and then making sure that we're lifting other things, but in those exact same ways. So heavy compound or light and lots of reps. Uh, light and lots of reps is not something that we do a ton of. We, we do some stuff that's more reps but if if you're a normal size adult and you're swinging a 35 pound kettlebell for 300 reps with your head at the sky in a training mask you you've missed some things there can be a lot more weight added when you increase intensity and positional acuteness more work gets done in a shorter time and that's really the goal with something like fighting. Also, you want to leave enough in the tank to be able to actually practice your craft. We see a lot of people in, in, in fighting, and again, it's just because they're so fucking brutal, but their strength and conditioning regimens are insane. And yes, that is going to make a strong person a little bit stronger, but it comes back to that risk-reward risk ratio. There has to be a sense to it in order for it to make sense. There has to be a strategy to it in order for it to translate to something like fighting that requires such strategy. And, and I think we've, we've gotten pretty good at that. So I, I kind of wanted to at least touch on some of that stuff and then uh, continue on by saying there's a ton of corresponding information on our site. Um, we, we, did a, we did a clinic at Tulsa, at Sansu Tulsa last year that was, that was fantastic and addressed a lot of these concepts. And then... This is something that got a really good response. We got a lot of good questions and, and a lot of great feedback even already. And we'll, we'll talk more about this and do it again. I've written a couple of short programs for this that we're also happy to pass on. We're, we're, we're a little bit too open source with certain things and, and that's gonna be one of them. But if someone has proven to us that they've been practicing what we're up to, I'd be happy to send out what we've made uh, that, that we think transfers even more directly to fighting. A lot of those positions can be trained in strength and conditioning and then they're at your fingertips when you actually go to apply them in, in training. Methods for making athletes stronger without getting heavier. Yeah, <laughs> so... People are going to get sick of hearing it. So again, because of the relativity of the weight, even in heavy kettlebell lifting and heavy mace swinging, in relativity, it is not heavy weight. So even if you're moving a 100 or 150 pound kettlebell, if you're a 200 pound person, that's still just a, that's, that's a, that's a great fraction of your body weight, but it's still not a, a gigantic amount of weight. It is not a real strength building amount of weight. So you're building baseline strength, you're building power, you're building power endurance, you're building midline stability as much as anything else, and you're building power dexterity and coordination, and you're not putting a lot of weight on. So 
we've seen a lot of intelligent conversation in the last six months or a year about people cutting less weight in fight sports and, and kind of just not staying in their natural weight classes, but not moving down 20 or 30 pounds, maybe moving down eight or 10 pounds or something. And there's always going to be big weight cutters. It's just the nature of the beast. But cutting less weight gives you a lot more platform to optimize the strength and power that you have. As long as you're doing so intelligently, we, we've seen some people lately that we, geez, we, we watch them and we, we watch them with, with, with a lot of interest. They've either moved up in weight classes um, or, or a phrase we hear a lot is, yeah, people not taking their power with them. I had to write it down because I've heard it so often, but I always forget. And, and realistically, I, I've never really understood that. If someone has power and then they get kind of a, a window of opportunity to improve that power and not cut quite as much weight and muscle, geez, if that, if that strength and conditioning is appropriate, then that person should be an animal. So that, that, that's something else that we would really strongly encourage is, is if you're fighting and, and, or if you, if, you, if you know someone that is and their strength and conditioning is, is, is not sensible or it's at least not as sensible as their fight training, just know that there is options out there that are there, there's there's an absolute there's an absolute under providing of information on the importance of detail in lifting and i think it's just because especially in martial arts applications the water's so deep especially mma you got to learn so much in order to keep up but when what you're doing in strength and conditioning insulates and improves it it's t it's time well spent so, methods for making athletes stronger without getting heavier, heavy maces, heavy kettlebells, smart, full range body weight stuff, and not so much work that your body is constantly just panicking and, and either holding on to weight the wrong way um, or trying to build stuff you don't need to build. There, ha there, has to be a, there has to be a method to the madness. It shouldn't just be beat the people into the ground or beat yourself into the ground every day that that just doesn't work long term see wolf brigade people being very strong but rarely very big in general isn't too big is too big yeah i mean i agree with all of that outside of pure gymnastics some of our people have the the best strength to weight ratios i've ever seen we have some really small, unassuming people that are really, really animals. And, and again, I, I believe it comes down to how we insulate and how we improve them. There's a giant midline stability focus, and it's a strength midline stability focus. It's not a volume midline stability focus. There's, there's no 300 sit-ups. You know, we'll do 15 sit-ups, but they'll take 30 seconds a piece. We'll do, you know, a sit-up that requires very similar dexterity to being on your back and grappling or something like that. Um, and, and that's the stuff that really allows people to move heavy weight confidently and then also transfer that power and strength into, into fighting pretty seamlessly. We've, we've, we've only had a couple of people train organically at our gym and then, and then go and fight, uh, but they've done extremely well. And it, it's also always been impressive to me how quick how quick they picked things up because of the, the strong strength and conditioning foundation and, and positioning foundation. Martial patterns and strength and conditioning patterns are no different. They just have to be adapted with this application-based nuance. If, if you're fighting, of course, you have to train fighting. And the notion of a sport-specific strength and conditioning is a whole other clusterfuck that I think is so funny. But the patterns can be very similar and they apply very similarly. You know, you don't have to box with weighted gloves on to get better at throwing a powerful punch. Questions on breathing and hollow holds uh, don't. <laughs> or well, I guess if we're, if we're saying that, we're going to say sips, not gulps. So if, if you're going to breathe during something like a hollow hold, it's, it's just a little teeny tiny panic breath. <laughs> So how did we create a, a how did we create a program that seems to naturally control for a weight class based sport? Well, yeah, again, Chris, it's a good question, and it, same, same drum, similar sound. 
it really comes down to enough but not too much and knowing how to kind of systematically assassinate people without putting them in the ground. You have to push people every day. You have to lift heavy. You have to lift powerfully. There has to be violence of action and everything. Uh, but it doesn't have to be these smash fests where everybody leaves just, you know, with their CNS shot and adrenal fatigue. That's just not how it works. And it's especially not how it works when you're going to cash that out three or four days a week, getting kicked and punched and, and choked and, and thrown on the ground. It didn't work for me. And, and that's where we that's where we started kind of, I guess, reimagining it, reengineering it a little bit is. I mean, I was banged up for months. I would never be healing, and, and part of it was diet, um, and, and that was a cool learning curve too. But but part of it was I was just I was just doing too much because the strength and conditioning was not strategized well enough yet. We we were still learning, and now now we're now we're there. What do you recommend or do for recovery? Also, do you recommend massage or Cairo? Yeah, thanks. I mean, just, you know, as far as conventional chiropractic, don't, don't, get, don't get involved with a chiropractor that just wants to crack you every three weeks whether you need it or not. Um, <laughs> we are just beyond lucky that we've got a, a place here in, in Rochester called Pittsburgh Performance Care that, that's uh, second to none is, is not even a strong enough affirmation for them. Uh, make sure that if someone is manipulating your body they know why and you've presented a symptom that actually corresponds with their response massages are great uh re recovery is great you got to stay moving you got to stay mobile and you know you got to eat like an athlete uh, a lot of people that are doing a, a singular martial art they're doing grappling or kickboxing or something and doing it kind of moonlighting their strength and conditioning suffers but also you know a lot of the lifestyle stuff comes up a little short if people aren't fighting professionally, then, you know, of course, they're, they're not going to be getting paid to train and, and eat right. But those things go a, a really long way in, in terms of recovery. So you can't, you can't understate the value of any of that. Hey, Gypsy. Use elevator sit-ups since my surgery on the low back and spine to rehab faster. Yeah. Yeah, I agree, I agree with that. All, all the get-your-ass-off-the-ground sit-ups are, are really engineered for, for fight sports. And and uh, they require a midline stability. The lot of staying on the ground sit-ups don't. So yeah, thank you. Thanks for mentioning it. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see what else we got. I think that might be it for questions. Someone tell me what time it is. That's not that's not a rhetorical question. <clears throat> so one other thing we want to mention is even up until the very high levels of, of witnessing strength and conditioning for fighting, thank you. We see a lot of um I don't know. I don't want to say patty cake. It really sounds derogatory. We, we see a lot of experimentation. Thank you, guys. Um, that we do not feel has an intelligent basis. We see a lot of kind of gimmicky type movements, patterns that don't really translate to anything. Weights that there is no chance that they are heavy enough or violent enough to make the person doing it actually stronger. And it, it, it's, it's really just kind of confusing to me because when, when we adapt something or when we adjust something, we've done so after either constructing or witnessing um, a sound and positionally accurate foundation. Once that stuff is in play, then there's value to intelligent experimentation. There, there's a straight line between experimentation and efficacy, but there has to be a foundation built first in order to actually see any progress and, and, and actually receive any information. there Again, there, there isn't one right way, but there is a ton of bad ways. And taking a thoroughbred athlete that's going to do well whatever you give them 
and thinking that because they do it well, it denotes progress is a really common mistake in, in strength and conditioning training for fighting. We've seen even stuff at the UFC Performance Institute, which looks like a pretty incredible facility that I just, I just cannot make, I just can't make heads or tails of. I've been doing this a long time. I've been paying a, a, what I would consider an abnormal amount of attention to this stuff for many, many years. And if something immediately makes zero sense to me, I, I really put a question mark on it. And, and as someone that's also trained and competed in, in martial arts, if I can't see a sense to it, I, I, I really often don't think there is one. Uh, I definitely do not know everything, but I know what stupid looks like. And when we see a fighter doing that stuff, and then in their fight, they prove that there were things they could have improved on in their strength and conditioning training, we hate seeing that. We want to help. Um, but the reality is trainers in those positions are not going to give them up. And they're certainly not going to let someone like us come in and, and, and turn over the apple cart. If you gave me a UFC fighter that's lost their last two fights on conditioning, I would put money that I don't have and a house that I will never have on the fact that I could turn that. And I, I don't really think that that's any type of false bravado or, or anything like that. I think it's, it's, it's humility and clarity. You need way less equipment than you think to make someone fight ready. Fighting is, fighting is a durability game. We, we, just, we just absolutely must do so sensibly. We have to construct that durability knowing that it's going to get tested in a bunch of other realms outside the one we're in. If we under address it and it ends up patty cake, then we've done them a disservice. If we overdo it and it ends up breaking them down to the point where they can't perform the task at hand appropriately, or they're either too banged up to fight, or even even, even neurologically, or, or even you know other sneaky things that may not be recovered enough, when it comes time to apply under pressure, when it comes time to actually perform under the lights, that, that's, that's, where, that's where we think that the, that the strategy has gone a little bit south. I think the trainers oftentimes are a little bit more concerned with looking interesting or, or keeping followers or staying relevant in a, in a, a very fickle and, and somewhat goofy marketplace than they are actually improving the fighters they're training. The equipment is only as good as the training. It, it, it truly and certainly is. Thank you, Elliot. Does it make sense to lift heavier than your weight class? Does it make sense to lift heavier than your weight class. I guess I don't totally understand that, Bailey. If you want to lay it on me again in a different way, I'll answer it. And then we'll get ready to close it up. If we've got any other questions, great. We really kind of just wanted to lay a foundation here and, and answer some questions. And then and then this is, this is an ongoing discussion. There, there's a lot of, I guess, specifics that we could toss in there. But, but the reality is, if you're moving better and harder and more violently and with a variety of implements that actually make sense for the sport that you're about to participate in, and what we've basically narrowed that down to is barbells, kettlebells, and maces, sandbags and such are amazing too, medicine balls, but um, the, the mixing of the modalities is what we've found makes the most complete athlete. We, 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 are not, we are not going to ever have the world's heaviest deadlifter. Not our point. We can help someone get there, and we have, but it's not necessarily our thing. We want to make the best mixed modality athletes that have ever walked the earth. And we want them to be unassuming, and if they don't want to gain a weight class, we don't want them to. We can optimize exactly where they are better than what we believe anything else in the world can do. And, and the fact that that transfers perfectly to fighting is not an accident or an oversight. Um, I mean, it's, it's the reason that I got into this whole thing in the first place. So, so to have deprioritized it would be basically to you know, dishonor the roots and, and the people that got me here where I am. I, I'll, I'll always say it. I, I was so fortunate to find a gym in Southern California that was prioritizing Thai boxing and grappling and then added in CrossFit, but then was also willing to adapt it. 
I mean, we never painted by numbers with CrossFit, even from the beginning. And, and I just can't say enough about, about my instructors and, and how fortunate I was. Lifting heavier weights than, than your opponent. Yeah, well, I mean, you don't know what they're lifting, and it doesn't necessarily matter. We would consider better insulation uh, more of an advantage than more weight. So you take a mace press, for example. You know, if, if you're here and you're in an arm lock and you know you can fight it from here, but if that dial turns 15 degrees and you can no longer fight it, well, you're fucked. So the advantage of the mace over a barbell or a lot of other things is you can press in every single iteration. You can press on every little tick in the dial and start strengthening all those little micro positions that get left out in a lot of other lifts. So, so we would consider thorough application, intelligent, varied implement, uh, more of a benefit than, than pure strength than, ju than just lifting more than your opponent. Lifting, lifting better, lifting more diversely but with a reason is, is probably how I would answer that question. Thank you so much. Thank you. And so wonderful to meet you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to call it. Th thank you very much for watching again. This will be sitting here for 24 hours. And then, and then thank you to Abby for putting it on uh, YouTube for us. Off topic. Yeah, we'll get to that next time, man. Thank you. We got put on hold with that stuff, too. People don't like to help us, man. Um, but they will. Thank you again, guys. Great questions. If you have any more, always feed them to us. And, and the way that this is going to transfer is getting passed on. People who are fighting, even people who are fighting professionally, even people who are successful at fighting professionally, I believe need to hear this type of thing. It's, a, it's, it's an important adjustment to be made. And I know I, I sometimes it, it sound a little bit out of my lane. Uh, I believe applying strategies like ours to strength and conditioning could change the entire future of, of mixed martial arts. So let's see. Only one way to find out.